Hey there, this is Professor Nathanson. Welcome. Uh, this is the second, number two, video on summary judgment. Uh, if you haven't watched the other one, you need to go back and watch the other one that um, talks about uh, various dispositive motions as well as kind of lays out summary judgment. This video, we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive. All right, so let's do this the way that I oftentimes like to which is by using a quiz, all right? So let's start off with this question here. Uh, Paul sues Debbie for a car wreck, all right? Debbie moves to dismiss under Rule 12b-6. Instead of just relying upon the face of Paul's complaint and saying that Paul doesn't state a claim, Debbie goes the next step. Debbie says, well, here, I got this affidavit. And in my affidavit, I say, um, I didn't do it. At the time of the alleged accident, I was bicycling across Alaska. I was looking at the Eagles, not the Philadelphia Eagles, the the Eagles in Alaska, right? And therefore could not have been in any accident with Paul. All right. Obviously, something doesn't smell right here, does it? 12b-6 is supposed to be based on the face of the complaint, right? Or things attached to the complaint or relied upon by the complaint. What Debbie's really doing with her affidavit is beyond just denying that she did it, say through an answer, she's signing a paper under oath, penalty of perjury that like, it wasn't me, I wasn't there, I didn't do it, couldn't have been me, wasn't me, please let me win. Well, that's not really appropriate under 12b-6, is it? If the court considers all the papers submitted by Debbie, what should the court do? Well, here's our options. Uh, a can't be correct. Grant the motion because Debbie's affidavit is uncontroverted evidence that she's not at fault. No, it's not. It's it's her sworn statement that she's not at fault, but maybe she's lying. Maybe other evidence will show that she's lying. Maybe she's mistaken. I don't know. But it's not uncontroverted evidence that she's not at fault. Okay. Deny the motion to dismiss because the job of determining who is at fault is for the jury and not for the judge. That's not quite true either. The purpose of summary judgment is to grant judgment as a matter of law in cases when there's no dispute, uh, no genuine dispute anyway, regarding uh, facts material to the claims, defenses, or issues. All right, so it can't be B. All right, uh, C, uh, grant the motion because Debbie's affidavit shows that Paul's complaint is not plausible um, on its um, face. Um, no. Oh, by the way, let me go back to B for a second. I misspoke. My bad. Um, I was speaking about summary judgment, but I just realized Debbie's moving under Rule 12b-6, but my point is otherwise the same. Deny the motion because of the job of determining who is at fault is for the jury and not for the judge, and that's just not true because motions like Rule 12b-6 or Rule 56 or Rule 50 uh, it, it lead can lead to the case being taken away by the judge and preventing a jury from being the ultimate decider. So B is not correct. All right. C is also incorrect because Debbie's affidavit doesn't show that Paul's complaint is not plausible at all. Instead, the answer here is to convert Debbie's motion to a Rule 56 motion for summary judgment and give Paul an opportunity to file competing affidavit. Uh, and to seek discovery. And we know this because of Rule 12D that we haven't previously talked about. If on a 12B6 motion, matters outside the pleading is presented to the court and not excluded by the court, then the motion must be treated as one under Rule 56 and all parties need opportunity to present material pertinent to the motion. So here the affidavit, all right, that's materials outside of the uh, plaintiff's complaint. All right, so if the court decides to consider uh, Debbie's affidavit, the court must convert the motion from a 12b6 motion to Rule 56 summary judgment motion, which means, you know, really in most cases that, that, that the plaintiff's going to have to have an opportunity at a minimum to submit his own affidavit and maybe even to have like, you know, some or a lot of discovery. So the answer here is D, right? We can't decide this under a Rule 56 summary judgment motion, at least if the court considers the affidavit. All right, let's move on. Paul files a lawsuit against Debbie for negligence from a car wreck. 
The day after Debbie was served with process, she files a motion for summary judgment. Is her motion timely? Uh, no, because summary judgment may not be made prior to answering. That's, that's actually false. Um, the rule says that a party may file a motion for summary judgment at any time until 30 days after the close of discovery. In theory, Debbie could file for summary judgment even before she served, you know, so long as she uh, knew about the lawsuit. She could file for summary judgment. Now, you know, the court could order otherwise, or the, the district court itself could order a different time under local rule, but barring that exception, summary judgment can be really early, right? And as late as 30 days after the close of all discovery. So, you know, A's uh, not uh, correct, right? Uh, her motion is timely. Having said that, the court's not going to grant it because, you know, uh, Paul's got to have a chance for his own affidavits or discovery. Um, C can't be correct. She, she doesn't have to wait until 30 days after the close of discovery. She's got, just got to move uh, before uh, 30 days after the close of uh, discovery. Um, it's not um, uh, B. It's not B. Summary judgment made prior to discovery, that's ridiculous. Most summary judgment motions really ought not be made until there's an opportunity for discovery. So the answer is D. Uh, she has a right to move before discovery, but again, even though she has a right to move, doesn't mean the court's going to grant it. So the answer is D. Moving on to three. Ultimately, he's going to ask, what's the proper standard for summary judgment? Paul files a lawsuit. Debbie later timely files for summary judgment. Which is it? Well, here, take a look at 56A. Um, All right, that's the standard. Is it Paul? Debbie must show there's a genuine dispute as to material facts and that Paul is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. Which is it? A, B, C, or D? Why don't you now pause the video? All right, pause the video on this, pull out your rule book, look at rule 56. What's the answer? A, B, C, or D? Go ahead and pause. I'll wait. You didn't pause. Pause. Very good. You paused. All right. Is the answer A? And the answer is no. This part is true. Or excuse me, um, Debbie's moving for summary judgment. So both these parts are false. Debbie must show that there's a dispute as to material facts. No, she needs to show that there's no dispute regarding the material facts. And certainly, she shouldn't be showing that Paul is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. Debbie's the one who's moving. So A is incorrect. Is it D? Debbie must show there's a genuine dispute as to material facts. No. She needs to show that there's no dispute, not a genuine one, as to material facts. Material facts are the ones that are relevant to the issue, the claim, or the defense that's being moved upon. Here, it's a motion seeking summary judgment in favor of the defendant on negligence. So she's got to show that regarding the facts that are relevant to the claim against her for negligence, that there's no genuine dispute regarding that claim, such that she's entitled to uh, uh, judgment as a matter of law. So if she shows there's a dispute, that means we need to have a jury find those facts. If there's a genuine dispute as to material relevant facts regarding negligence, regarding whether she was there, whether she did it, did she breach a duty, was there harm caused, causation. If there's a genuine dispute regarding facts, and that's answer A and D, then we need a jury. Summary judgment is only appropriate in cases where we don't need a jury. All right? So A and D are wrong. What about B and C. All right, Debbie must show that what, Paul is entitled to judgment as a matter of law? No, the moving party is supposed to show that the moving party is entitled to a matter of law. Debbie is not moving to show that Paul must win. That's absurd. All right, so the answer here is C. Debbie, here the defendant, must show there's no genuine dispute as to material facts, meaning that a jury is not needed, and that she, the moving party, is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. We see this if we go to 56A. A party can move for ju summary judgment. Note that it's a may. You don't have to, but you, ha you, you have the permission to. Identify the claim or defense or the part of a claim or defense seeking summary judgment. So Paul could seek summary judgment saying that he wins on negligence. Debbie could move on summary judgment and say that she wins 
because there's no negligence, right? Or maybe Debbie's got some sort of defense, right? Like uh, contributory negligence that shows she wins. So she moves for summary judgment, arguing that Paul was contributory negligent as a matter of law, right? So it could be on a claim or a defense, or in a part of a claim or a defense. Well, here it says the court shall grant summary judgment if the movement shows, and here's the key language, no genuine dispute as to any material fact, and that the movement is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. And the court's got to explain why. State on the record the reasons for granting or denying. All right. Well, this shall here is a little less affirmative than must, um, so it kind of seems maybe to give the court a little bit of wiggle room, okay? But the key to the standard is this language. No genuine dispute as to any material fact, all right? So the facts have to be material. If there's a dispute over what color Debbie's car was, that might be a dispute, but it might, might not be genuine if it's not relevant to determining whether or not Debbie was negligent, right? Was Debbie drinking? Was Debbie present in the car? Was Debbie the one driving the car? Was she driving too fast? Was she drunk? Those are material facts regarding Paul's claim, okay? If there's a genuine dispute as to facts that are material on Paul's claim, then summary judgment has to be denied, all right? But if there's no genuine material dispute, genu no genuine dispute as to material fact, then the court can decide whether the moving party is entitled to judgment as a matter of law, right? Now, now think of it, right? Suppose Paul is moving for summary judgment saying that Debbie was drunk and uh, ran him over and uh, caused him harm, right? Well, suppose after discovery, uh, Debbie moves for summary judgment saying that Paul's got no evidence um, that Debbie was driving the car at that time because she was in Alaska, right? And she shows that there's pictures of her in Alaska and affidavits from people who stayed with her in Alaska. And she has her plane tickets, right? In her deposition, she said she was in Alaska. And, and her, her friend was also deposed saying she was there in Alaska. And Paul's got nothing, right? Well, under such circumstances, uh, Paul's got nothing and, and, and Debbie's got a lot, and there's just no genuine dispute. Paul might say, well, I showed him my complaint, it was her, but that's not going to be enough. That's not a genuine dispute. What does he have that might be either admissible in evidence, right, or reducible to admissible evidence? So under such circumstances, there's no genuine dispute as to material fact, and here the court uh, uh, has the ability to grant Debbie uh, judgment as a matter of law. We just don't need a jury. We don't need a trial here. That's why summary judgment is the... All right. So the answer here is uh, B, right? The moving party must show there's no genuine dispute as to material facts and that the moving party is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. Note that Paul, the plaintiff, could also move for summary judgment, right, on his own claim. Suppose Paul has videos showing that Debbie was driving, witnesses showing that Debbie was driving. The whole thing was captured on camera, right? And you have all the evidence showing that Debbie was doing it, Debbie was driving, Debbie hit him, Debbie hurt him and all sorts of evidence of, of, of Paul's um, harm, right? His hospital bills, right? And Debbie's got nothing. Debbie's got nothing whatsoever. Debbie doesn't even have an affidavit saying that she didn't drive. Under such circumstances, a Paul here could move for summary judgment on his own claim because why do we need a trial? Here now, it's Debbie the one the one that has to put up or shut up with evidence, or I should say material, materials that are admissible or reducible to admission at trial to show that she wasn't the driver or she didn't wasn't negligent or she didn't harm Paul. All right, so either party could move for summary judgment. Let's move on to question four. All right, freeze on this one, figure it out for yourself, and then we'll discuss it. Is the answer A, B, C, or D? Paul's filed for Debbie, uh, for, for, against Debbie. Debbie moves for summary judgment in opposition to Debbie's motion. Paul files an affidavit saying Paul was an adult of sound mind. That although he lacked information as to who the driver was, he thought it was likely and therefore believed um, that Debbie was the driver. Is Paul's affidavit a proper response to Debbie, Debbie's motion A, B, um, C, um, or D? Right? All right. Pause the video and we'll come back.
All right. So the answer A, Paul has actual knowledge of his own belief. Uh, no, that, that's not a good answer. Like, well, what's supposed to be in an affidavit? Well, let's look at the rule. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, 56C4. An affidavit has to be made on personal knowledge, set out facts admissible in evidence, and show that the affiant is competent to testify on the matter stated. So, I, Paul, an adult of sound mind over the age of 18, uh, have knowledge, personal knowledge, of the following, blah, 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 right? A uh, declaration is similar to an affidavit. This is something that's allowed under federal statute. Doesn't require uh, uh, the same kind of language, but it has the same effect, right? Doesn't have to be uh, notarized, I believe is the distinction, All right? But has the same effect in terms of its legal import in federal court. All right, well, the problem here under uh, 4A is having actual knowledge of your own belief is irrelevant. Paul's affidavit says that Paul was the... Uh, Paul Paul's affidavit says that although he lacked information as to who the driver was, he thought it was likely and therefore believed that Debbie was the driver. Sorry, that's not going to uh, suffice. Uh, Paul's knowledge of his own belief is not admissible in court as to who was the actual driver, right? Um, so that's not a good answer. Um, Paul's affidavit is not rooted in personal knowledge regarding whether Debbie was the driver. Um, yeah, that's the answer. B is the answer. Paul's affidavit has to be based on personal knowledge and has admissible evidence. And if the missing information in the lawsuit, the whole in, in Paul's case is whether Debbie was the driver, Paul's having an affidavit saying he thought it was likely that Debbie was the driver, uh, even though he lacked information, that's just BS. All right. What Paul needs is either admissible evidence of who, uh, of whether it was Debbie or something that could be reduced to admissible evidence. We'll get to that in the next question. All right. Um, so the answer is B. It can't be C. Uh, Paul's credibility may be relevant and something that a jury could decide, but Paul hasn't even put forth anything that could possibly be admissible or made admissible regarding whether it was Debbie, right? Now, D is partially true. Affidavits are ordinarily not evidence. They're ordinarily not admissible in court. It said an affidavit is a piece of paper that represents what would be said in court or what would be presented in court, right? Uh, no is the answer, but B is the proper answer. Paul's affidavit has personal knowledge of his belief, but it does not have personal knowledge of who the driver was. In fact, it says he lacks information as to who the driver was. That's a BS response, right? So Paul's affidavit is not enough to support um, his case. Look at number five. Again, look at it, pause it, and then consider it. All right. Paul files a lawsuit against Debbie. All right, pause it. All right. Debbie moves for summary judgment, arguing that Paul has no evidence. In opposition, Paul files a portion of his deposition, which is sworn oral testimony, where Paul says that his friend Xavier told him that he saw Debbie driving the car that hit him. Is Paul's deposition a proper way of opposing the motion? All right. Well, A is not a good answer. Uh, Paul, in fact, does have actual knowledge of what Xavier told him. But here's a problem. Paul saying what Xavier told him is hearsay. Paul is saying it is in his affidavit. What Xavier told him, that's an out-of-court statement offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Paul is offering Xavier's statement to prove that Debbie was driving. But Paul does not have personal knowledge of who was driving. Paul has personal knowledge of what Xavier said. What Xavier said is an out-of-court statement. All right, that's hearsay. So, you know, Paul could not testify at trial that Xavier told him that he saw Debbie driving the car. Now, when you take evidence, you'll learn that there are exceptions to the hearsay rule, but I'm not aware of any hearsay exceptions that would allow Paul to testify like this at trial. So Paul's saying that Xavier told him Debbie was driving is probably not going to be admissible at trial. However, if we look at the rule, all right, it says something um, interesting. All right, uh, let me just pause for a second here because... 
I hear some talking in the other room, and I want to close my office door. Okay, we're back. All right, here's the key right here. You know, uh, uh, you know, an affidavit has to be on personal knowledge. Paul's affidavit isn't it, based on some personal knowledge. He knows what Xavier said to him, but the problem is, is what Xavier said to him, and that's not going to be admissible um, under the hearsay rule. We don't know of any exception that would apply. So look at this. Section C2. A party may object that material cited to support or dispute a fact cannot be presented in a form that would be admissible in evidence. So the question for summary judgment here is not whether or not it is not whether the hearsay is admissible. I don't think it is. The question is whether the hearsay could be turned into a form that's admissible um, in evidence. And the answer here is yes. So you think about it. If you are, where were we? It was question five, right? Yeah. Question five. So Paul's de Paul's deposition um, is sworn discovery testimony, not his affidavit. Uh, Paul says in his deposition that, yeah, Xavier told me he saw Debbie driving the car that hit him. Well, that itself is not admissible in evidence, but under 56 uh, uh, C4, could Paul's deposition statement about what Xavier told him, could that be, uh, uh, whoops, here we go, C2. Could that be presented in a form admissible in evidence? Yeah, it's really easy. You just get um, Xavier to testify at trial. So, I mean, what Paul really should have done in opposition to Debbie's uh, summary judgment is get an affidavit from Xavier, right? Or a deposition from Xavier. An affidavit, though, from Xavier, a sworn statement from Xavier would suffice. Xavier would say, I, Xavier, I'm an adult over 18 of sound mind. Um, this is based on personal knowledge. I saw Debbie driving the car. She's drinking out of a brown paper bag. She was saying, I'm drunk, I'm drunk. And then she ran over Paul. And I saw it with my own eyes. And by the way, I have 20-20 vision. How do you like them apples, right? That could be done. And by the way, all of that is something that could be pre presented at trial. Because Xavier could then get up on the stand and testify to all that stuff. So, you know, this hearsay that Paul has um, used... Uh, by citing to his deposition. It's kind of a sloppy way to respond to Debbie's summary judgment motion. He should have gotten an affidavit from Xavier. But this is also maybe enough to oppose summary judgment because, no, even though the deposition is not something that could be admitted into evidence and uh, Paul could not testify to this at trial, uh, certainly Xavier could, right? So here you go. So A is not correct. Um, who cares what Paul has actual knowledge of? Um, B is not correct. Um, it's true that the the, uh, the the statement here is is hearsay, right? Um, D is not correct. Uh, it's true depositions are ordinarily not used um, at trial, right? Uh, depositions are not ordinarily used at trial. Sometimes they are, particularly to impeach the credibility of of a deponent. Um, uh, but usually depositions are just evidence of what that person would say at trial. Right? So the answer here is C, because Xavier could testify um, at trial. All right, let's move on. Uh, question six. Paul sued Debbie for negligence arising from a car accident. Shortly after being served with process, uh, Debbie moved for summary judgment, relying on her own affidavit, stating that she was not the driver of the car that hit Paul. Can the court grant summary judgment to Debbie uh, based on her affidavit? All right. Uh, pause, all right, and then come back. Go ahead, pause. All right. Answer one. Oh, that should be A, whatever. Summary judgment is appropriate if the court find Debbie's affidavit to be plausible. No, no. First of all, that sounds like some rule uh, 12b-6 bumbo jumbo, right? And also, the court's not supposed to be determining the believability or credibility of the affidavits, all right? Finding facts, determining credibility, that's for trial, all right? Um, so the first answer is just BS, all right? Uh, second one, summary judgment's not appropriate early in the litigation. Not a bad answer, right? Not a bad answer, uh, but sometimes summary judgment is appropriate earlier in the litigation, right? 
Uh, uh, answer number four. If Debbie's affidavit suggests to the court that she was not uh, the driver. Um, well, that's actually a, a, an appropriate way to move for summary judgment. That's the Celotex method. Uh, but it's still not the right answer because answer three, we kind of discussed this before. Courts should ordinarily, ordinarily grant summary judgment until the opposing party, the non-moving party, has an opportunity to file affidavits or seek discovery. Right? I mean, that's just a basic idea of due process. All right, we'll move on. Car of the question. Can the court grant summary judgment to Paul on the issue of whether Debbie was driving the car that hit Paul? Read the rest of the question. Read the answers. Pause. All right, the answer here is this one. Four. Right? Here, the court has considered all the parties' submissions and showed a reasonable jury must conclude Debbie was the driver, but thinks the jury still needed to decide the issues of whether Debbie breached a duty and whether a breach caused Paul any damage. I mean, think about that. That makes sense. Maybe it's conclusively shown that Debbie was the driver, but there's still kind of, we need a jury to decide whether there was a breach and whether or not that breach caused any damages. Well, here the court can grant a summary judgment. We saw this uh, in, in the rule. So let's take a look at the rule, okay? Look here at section sub G. If the court does not grant all the re relief requests in the motion, it may enter an order stating any material fact, such as it was Debbie who was driving, that is not genuinely in dispute in treating the fact as established in the case. All right? So summary judgment can also be used to kind of like knock out facts that are, you know, otherwise going to be, now, that are now going to be established. All right. So let's keep moving. We have uh, two more questions. And Paul. Sues Debbie. After discovery, Debbie moves for summary judgment. Debbie submits an affidavit denying she was the driver. Paul responds by saying, I don't have to submit anything. I'll stand by the allegations of my complaint. Can the court grant summary judgment? Pause and answer. Okay. Go ahead. Pause. All right. So the answer here is uh, this one, the first one. Debbie put forth materials that disprove one or more of Paul's necessary elements, and Paul has not responded with any admissible materials. All right, well, think about it. When Debbie says, I wasn't driving, I wasn't there, that means she didn't breach any duty and thus didn't cause any harms. She's knocking out breach. She's knocking out um, causation. I didn't do it, right? And she has an affidavit that was done under oath. Now, could she be lying? Sure, but she's she's lying. She's done it under oath and opens herself up to criminal charges of perjury, right? Now, Paul says, I'll just stand by the allegations of my complaint, but he can't do that, all right? Complaint is not evidence. A complaint is not reducible to evidence. He's got to come forth with some sort of um, materials to show that there's a need for a jury, right? You can't just say, I'll stand by my complaint. He could come with an affidavit for Xavier saying that, no, it was Debbie. I sure are doing it. He could come forth with a, a video. Um, he could come forth um, just with something that, that, that shows that we have a need for a jury, right? doesn't matter how strong, but it's got to be something, right? If Paul comes forth with an affidavit from Xavier and it turns out Xavier has been in and previously was in jail for 30 years for uh, fraud and theft, and that he was a really bad guy. It doesn't matter, okay? We're not judging credibility here, all right? We just have something that shows that there's a need, there's a genuine dispute as to material fact, all right? So the answer here um, is uh, number uh, one, all right? Move on to number nine. Paul files a lawsuit against Debbie. For negligence arising from a car wreck after discovery, Debbie moves for summary judgment. Debbie, in support of her motion, says Paul has had months to do discovery and has no evidence that it was me who hit him. All right. 
Her motion discusses the discovery the parties have taken and notes that none of it points to Debbie. If Paul doesn't respond with an affidavit or discovery materials, can the court grant summary judgment? All right, pause. Wait for it. All right, is the answer one? No, because Debbie has failed to submit materials such as affidavit. The answer is no. Debbie doesn't have to. All right. Is it two? Yes, because Paul did not respond to the motion and thus has waived his claim. No, that's just BS. You know? All right. Is it number four? No, because the burden of summary judgment rests on the movement Debbie. Well, that's true and not on Paul. Paul has no duty to respond. Well, that's true. Under the rule, Debbie party, right? All right. And the moving party has to show, in other words, the, the, the burden of summary judgment is on the moving party. So is the, the answer the last one, right? Is it uh, number four? No, the answer is number three. Debbie can, in fact, seek summary judgment by suggesting to the court that Paul lacks admissible evidence on one or more of the necessary element of his claim. All right. That's the correct answer. And that's because of a Supreme Court called Celotex, which is now um, kind of uh, codified in the rule. Let's look at the rule. All right, how do you move for summary judgment? Well, there's a C1A method and there's a C1B method. C1A method is putting forth your own stuff, citing, por citing parts of the record, like depositions or documents, or making your own um, affidavits, right, or declarations. That's putting forth your own show. Like, I'm moving for summary judgment, and here's my affidavit. Well, that was question number um, eight, right? Question number eight. That's an example of a C1A moving for summary judgment, putting forth your own materials to disprove one or more of Paul's necessary elements. That's C1A, all right? Again, take a look at C1A. That's putting forth your own materials. C1B is showing that the materials do not establish the absence or excuse me, showing that the materials cited do not show, and here you got to parse the language, showing the materials cited do not establish the presence of genuine dispute. Um, or, even more pertinently, that here the adverse party, Paul, cannot produce admissible evidence to support a fact. So, I mean, you know, the, let's read this together. Look what Debbie has done. Debbie says Paul is months to do discovery and has no evidence. She discusses the discovery the parties have taken and that none of it points to Debbie. So Debbie's basically saying Paul's got nothing. And by the way, Paul had lots of discovery. He took depositions, right? We looked at documents. We talked to this person, that person, the other. And Paul's got nothing. So, you know, Paul's had his opportunity to, to show that we need a jury. And Debbie has done two things. Any materials cited, all right, there's like depositions, right? Do not establish the presence. Thing in the depositions or other discovery show that it was me that did it. And by the way, she's then arguing or suggesting to the court that Paul, after all of these opportunities for discovery, cannot produce admissible evidence to support that I, Debbie, was the driver. Well, this is a method of summary judgment that was approved by the Supreme Court in a case called Celotex. In Celotex, um, a, 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 uh, uh, a lady, uh, a, a, a widow, uh, sued a bunch of manufacturers of asbestos saying that one of them had made asbestos that eventually had killed her husband from, uh, I believe, asbestos died, asbest, asbestosis, if I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly. And one of those companies um, said to this lady, her name was Mrs. Catrett, Mrs. Catrett, you've got nothing. You, you've got nothing that shows that uh, that we defended Celotex made the Celot made the uh, asbestos that made your husband sick, right? So you know you got nothing, and the Supreme Court said that that was an okay way to move for summary judgment, to show the court by suggesting the court. You know, there's been discovery, and the the uh, the non-moving party's got nothing to show that it was us that made the asbestos, that it was I, Debbie, who did it, right? So the, the, the kind of kind of takeaway from all this is if you're moving
Uh, sorry for the glitch there. Um, my uh, computer hard drive filled up. So let me finish the thought that I was making. So the takeaway here is, if you're somebody like Debbie, and you're moving for summary judgment, you can combine the two methods, right? So let's take a look back at the uh, rule. If I could shift over there real quick, and then we can wrap up. If I'm Debbie, I can uh, put forth my own affidavits saying, hey, I didn't do it, right? And I can also uh, show that, that Paul's had... Uh, um, lots of opportunity for discovery, and you've got nothing to show that it was me doing it. We don't need a jury. Um, you can combine those. You do the one, the other. Even better if you can combine them and move for uh, summary judgment that way. All right. So what I recommend you do in, in, in closing is look through all the handouts. I'm not going to go through this uh, other handout that I gave you, uh, which is the... Uh, Uh, I'm not going to go through all the handouts right now. All right, this one that I also assigned. But, you know, go through this one yourself. This one goes through um, the various types of summary judgment. Um, it really just comes down to who's moving for summary judgment. Is it a plaintiff or a defendant? Is it a claimant or a defending party? And are they moving for summary judgment um, on um, their own claim? Um, or are they moving for summary judgment on a claim against them? right? Or are they moving for summary judgment on their own defense? Or are they moving to knock out somebody else's defense? So this um, handout rewards the diligent that work through all the kind of delicious uh, nooks and crannies. I'm not going to go through uh, this um, one itself. Uh, the only thing I will say about it is, you know, when you're looking to knock out somebody else's claim or defense, usually it's enough to just knock out one leg of it, right? So, you know, when you're being sued for something, for example, say for um, negligence, right? Well, negligence has uh, multiple elements here. Let me go to a face so we can look at faces now. Say you're sued for negligence, right? Well, you got duty, breach, uh, causation, and damages, right? So the duty is laid out by the court, right? The court determines that. But whether there's a breach, causation, or damages, that involves, you know, fact-finding, right? So if you show there's no breach, there's no negligence. Or if there's a breach but there's no causation, then there's no, ne no negligence. And if there's a breach, causation, but no damages, then there may be no remedy whatsoever, unless there's, you know, like nominal damages, right? So you got to think of element-based claims as kind of like a, a tripod. You know, a tripod is is like a, something a camera goes on. It's got three legs. Well, what happens to a tripod if you break one leg and only two, two legs remain? The whole thing falls down, right? Or a table that's got three legs. Break one leg, the table goes down. The table's not going to stand on just two legs. And multi-element-based uh, causes of action are the same way. So if you have four elements, all that are required, and you can knock one out, then the whole thing falls, right? And that's kind of summary judgment, how it works. If you're a defendant and you've been sued, if you can just show that the plaintiff is going to lose on one element, then the plaintiff has to lose. And that's how summary judgment usually proceeds. You, the, the, the moving party, typically a defendant, moves for summary judgment on one of the necessary elements. All right, so that's enough video for now. I've recorded three videos today. I think I've had enough for one day. Um, I'm sure you've had enough for one day, and uh, I hope these videos have been helpful to you. Um, go Steelers, and uh, uh, take care. Talk to you soon.